Okay, so now I want to talk about Playco, your new company, which had a successful um, Series A, 100 million of funding. Um, before we go into specific, um, could you tell me, you know, what Playco is again? So uh, Playco is focused on something very, very simple. Um, that seems so simple that it, it almost seems like it, sh it shouldn't be um, enough to, to go and build a huge company on. It's, it's a very basic idea, which is you should be able to play games with your friends very easily. Um, and so I started alluding to this earlier and um, in the very beginning of the podcast, but you know, it turns out um, it's such an obvious thing to say. People want to play with their friends. Everybody would agree with this. And the market for this is literally everyone. If you just say people want to play with their friends, this is everyone. My grandmother, your grandmother, everybody wants to interact and have positive interactions with the people they care about, um, whether it's family, friends, um, or people that just they, they want to connect with, right? Um, and that is, it's just too difficult to do right now. And because it's too difficult, um, it's actually surprisingly uncommon. And, and so you have this thing that if you could successfully make it work in a way that it, it should, and that's easy enough, that it could be something that we all do and that we all do regularly. Um, you know, we're on Zoom right now and Zoom solved the problem of how do you make video chat easy? Right. It's, not just, it's not just coronavirus that makes us all using video chat right now. It's also that Zoom really solved the problem. I mean, video chat has been around for um, like what, over 10 years, right? Um, right. And, and in many ways, it's been buggy. It's been very difficult to use. And so people didn't use it. But even before coronavirus, Zoom was growing like crazy because they figured out how to make it so easy. You just drop a link, tap it, and you're, you're chatting. And it's so predictable the way that it works. And so if you think about Zoom, they have that, that link that you just send. And you never worry about, like, is, is he on an iPhone or what is he using and what does right. he have to do? Um, and we're building that experience for games. Um, and what that means is that you can just hop, hop into a game with me just as predictably as you could expect me to jump on Zoom without any issues, except for I would say I would go one step further and say that it'll be even easier for you to play a game um, using our, our, our tech than, than Zoom because Zoom, some people still download the app, right? You can use it in a web browser, but a lot of people still use the app and our games like it, it's not even necessary. Um, and so we're excited about like the new experiences that we'll create. Because we all have, we all have these mobile devices with messengers and with video chat on them. And you know, what other types of experiences can we have now that we're in these spaces together? Like, what what types of things do we want to be doing in, in a Zoom chat together? I've seen people going and playing poker games where they they all say, okay, everybody, load up this URL in your web browser, and we'll all go to this website together and play poker together. Like, why isn't that part of the experience right in front of us? Why isn't it integrated into this experience? It's something that's easy for us to do. Um, these are the problems we're going out and solving. So we're working with a bunch of these partner companies that, that um, have these social services, um, whether it's messengers or video chats and, and, and other types of uh, social services and just trying to figure out like what is the best experience for each of these and uh, what types of activities do people wanna do in this space? How can we help people connect in a way that's more meaningful? Right. So, and you team up with Michael Carter. And when I heard that news about two weeks ago uh, on TechCrunch, I was blown away. And because I knew by Michael, uh, he has a really good experience in venture capital industry, but also he started Game Closure. And Game Closure was uh, pretty much doing a very similar thing, right? Uh, you, you can play game on the HTML. And he moved his company, which was in the Bay Area, to Japan because he, what, I, what he told me was that because there are you know, bigger markets for gaming in Japan, why Preco was founded in Japan? Was it for the same reason? Well, um, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, what I'll say in general is that um, game companies have been already um, recently, the largest game companies have been growing outside of the US. So when we think about the biggest, most exciting recent game companies that have been um, invested in or have just been making a lot of news. We think about like Playrix, you know, they're in Europe. Um, we think about Wildlife, they're in Latin America. Um, these, these companies, like probably of the top 10 game companies right now that are sort of private, large, fast growing mobile game companies, the majority of them are no longer in the US. Um, so this transition has happened. It's already been happening 
<laughs> and so what we're seeing is that this talent is everywhere. And in, in, the, in a world where this talent is, is really everywhere and they're, they're learning and, and they're excelling at these different companies all around the world now, um, like how should a company be architected to succeed when that's the future? And so, you know, 13, 14 years ago, maybe the answer was start a company in San Francisco. Right. Um, do that. But today, that, I don't think that's the answer, actually. And so it's already playing out that these companies are succeeding in a very big way. And so what we wanted to do was figure out how do we take advantage of this idea and this fact that there are great people all around the world. And I think um, being having a strong presence in Japan is huge because there's a, such a rich history of gaming here. There's some of the best gaming companies in the world. And the, the talent like of creating these characters and these stories um, that I mentioned before, this is something that's um, it, Japan is the, the, the leader in the world in this type of uh, business. And so what inspired me is I think that there's an opportunity to, to work with um, the best people in Japan and mm -hmm. work with the best people in Silicon Valley. And then um, to have sort of one leg in Silicon Valley and one leg in, in Japan, and then be distributed everywhere in the world uh, and build this sort of new type of company where we have a strong base in, in places mm -hmm. that are really important but then we also have employees um, that are everywhere. And so we've been building the company in this distributed fashion. And, and we have uh, a lot of employees in you know, many, many different countries all around the world now. And we work um, remotely. We're growing very quickly during the age right. of COVID and all done over video chat. Maybe that's the new definition of the new international startup, right? One leg in, in Silicon Valley and one leg in Japan, because you know, US is a still really big market. If you, you know, Kind of have a kind of monopoly in the U.S. Uh, you can go bigger in the international market, but also you need to cover Asia market, right? Especially in the gaming, uh, understood. And okay, I have another two final questions. So another one would be you raise hundred million dollars for Series A. That's a big, big, big uh, raising, especially for the venture industry in Japan. Uh, what's the hundred million for? Uh, rather than the stuff that you mentioned, something that you're building right now, you already hired seventy five people, right? So I assume. A lot of things are going to go on there, but could you tell us something that you can tell here? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think we're thinking about this from a very long-term perspective, right? And so um, the people and the partners that we have, they, they understand that. And it's not that what we're doing is, is super capital intensive, like we're going to go build one giant game that requires $100 million mm. to build. It's more like we have so much interesting territory we need to explore um that you know we that it's all very very compelling not like we're searching for something that'll work um mm. it's like we have a lot of things we're very confident that the, they'll work and that people are going to love and and we want to make sure we're making progress on on an, a, a bunch of them and so I, I i earlier i said at zynga we we had this you know we had many games that succeeded before we got to farmville um and we're still in the early stages of playco where we have products out already um, actually that are succeeding and we're just not ready to talk about them yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're learning a lot from those and we're going to keep learning and, and keep iterating and releasing more and, and discovering more like how these things work. Um, and our hope is that like every, we're learning something from everything we release, whether it's a feature or a game, we're always making progress toward fulfilling our vision as we're describing it. Right. And someday, maybe, you know, in a few years we have our farm built. And all of a sudden there's a game that has over a billion people playing it at once. Um, and it sounds crazy, um, but we think, we think it's achievable. Um, you know, back when, when Farmville came out, it had three quarters of everybody on Facebook was playing the game. Um, and and if, if that happened today with how big the ecosystem is, it would be, it would be something like over 2 billion people would be playing this game. And so the fact that people haven't been able to achieve that has to do with the structure of the mobile games market. The way all the games are distributed now is only through advertising. Um, and that's very limiting in the sense that the only way to grow faster is to make more revenue for each user right. that comes. And then you can mm -hmm. reinvest that in advertising. And there's right. nothing like wrong with this model, except for the fact that it actually incentivizes developers not to make games that you can play with your friends. Mm. So, um, and this isn't obvious to most people, but every player that you purchase through an ad that doesn't spend money will lower the amount of money you make per player. And so if I bought two users and one of them spends money and one of them doesn't, well, that right. person who doesn't is lower the average amount of money that it made per user, right? And so the game companies have become excellent at targeting the players 
who are likely to spend money. And a lot of the ad technology has been about making that easier to do and, and more precise. Um, the unfortunate side effect of this is um, not everyone wants to spend money in games. And so uh, <laughs> when you want to play with your friends, if they're, not a, if they're not a spender, well, then they're not getting the advertisement. And so if you've ever wondered, why do I play this game and none of my friends play it? It's because everybody's being targeted for the exact thing that's right for them. And no one's focused on making a game that everyone can play together because the economics right. don't work this current advertising ecosystem. And so we need, a, we need to figure out the technology and the design around an ecosystem that will support people to discover these games in a way that's very frictionless and low cost. And so those are the problems that we're solving. And when we solve that, then we can go and make games that people can play with their friends.